Hello and welcome to the Dancers Podcast. I am your host, Dan Donahue. Please check out the Patreon. Check out the link tree. If you're watching for free, that's fine. But please subscribe. If you're getting it for free, please subscribe. Because you know what? And what I'm about to say is going to change pretty soon. I have some really exciting news, actually. Uh, I, I, I really can't hold this in for much longer. I am happy to announce that I have gotten my first audition for an advertiser. I, I know a lot of you might be thinking, Dan, what do you mean an audition for an advertiser? Shouldn't advertisers be reaching out to you? Shouldn't they be asking to sponsor the podcast? Uh, and I say maybe you could look at it that way, but I don't look at it that way. I look at it. Like, you need to justify your keep in this world. Okay? We're, we're past kind of the times where someone would give you an adequate amount of pay for a job well done. That's over. Okay? Nowadays, you still have to do a job well done, but you're doing it for exposure. Okay? That's the name of the game is exposure. Dan, exposure doesn't pay the bills. Well, you're not using it right. OK, the goal now when it comes to entertainment, when it comes to comedy, when it comes to podcasting is to get exposure and then uh, to use that exposure to beg for money on TikTok live. That's the beautiful economy we live in today. You don't need to afford a house. OK, <laughs> you don't need. Oh, I want a house. Hey, hey, listen. Aren't we taught as citizens of the United States of America to take what we get and appreciate it? Don't focus on that group of people that were the one percent of a, of the uh, country and the world that are driving a McLaren into your apartment building and then for some reason not getting sued because they bought a wing at the Department of Public Works in the city. Don't focus on that guy. Stay in your lane, okay? Stay in your lane. Because if you get out of your lane, you might realize how unfair everything is for you. So I got my manager uh, messaged me. I'm, I'm going to go on live with my manager soon, I think, just to let you guys in on uh, on our relationship. He messages me, and I go, uh, excuse me, uh, my manager, um, do we have any potential money opportunities and he says dan of course not and i say okay uh do we have maybe like an audition for a role in a tv series or movie or even a small one even a web series he goes dan of course not and i go i don't even know why i would ask that because that's far too much to ask um what what do we have and he says dan i have an audition for an ad. So I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, shift seamlessly because I want to tell you guys uh, about a product totally naturally. And first of all, I, I just want to say thank you to this sponsor. Uh, well, th this potential sponsor. You're not a sponsor yet. Um, okay. Now, I'm just going to shift topics into talking about something that I was going to talk about anyway with you guys. Uh, Donghua Jilan's Industrial Grade Glycin. Dan, what is Industrial Grade Glycin? I'm glad you asked. You don't need to know. All you need to know is that uh, Donghua Jilan has been in the field for over 40 years. Is a well-established brand. And uh, has a factory that adheres to strict FCC E640 USB BP EP and JFA standards. Folks, I don't know why you would get industrial grade glycine from anyone other than Donghua Jilan. They have so many patents. Their glycine is top shelf. So if you need industrial grade glycine, please... Go to the website of Donghua Jilan. You will be directed to a phone number where you will text a man. The man will meet you in a back alleyway, and you will barter with him. Pick the wrong number, you're not coming home. Donghua Jilan. All right, so, you know, I hope they like that. I hope they see that uh, ad. You know, I, I did my best on it. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, 
we have a couple of things to get to uh, in the means of self-help, baby, because that's what the Dancers Podcast is all about. It's the self-help podcast for people who don't want to improve that much. Um, I made a little purchase. I wasn't going through a horrible dark time, but I was having a bad week. When I have a bad week, my first impulse is to do something stupid to try to improve myself. And so I got online and I bought this journal. It's not just a journal. It's not a blank page. It gives you like little boxes for my goals and things I appreciate. And it's the kind of thing that you would do if you were incredibly unhappy with your life, which at the time I was. So I bought the journal. I did not know that this journal had a conservative tinge to it until I opened it and I saw one of the first things in the journal is an Ayn Rand quote. I am so frustrated with the fact that self-help for some reason in this country is so closely aligned to conservatism. I don't know why that is. I don't like it. I, I, I'm frustrated with the fact that, uh, you know, we've kind of just wholehandedly given that industry over to them. And sure, is it kind of like a, whatever, a conservative thing to be like, oh, you should take an ice bath right now. Yeah, sure, sure. But you should, like, it's good for you in general. Don't give health away. I don't know why the left, and also the right does this too. It, it's a baffling thing to me where so, we'll, you consider something to be aligned with the other side. So you stop doing it as I guess a form of protest, but it's just very strange. Cause listen, I'm not a I'm not a middle of the road guy. I I fall on the left on most every issue. Uh but you do need conservatives. You need them. And conservatives need people on the left. I wish there was more understanding of that. We all think that we could live in this like hermetically sealed bubble, but it's like you need to get your car fixed. When you find a leftist auto body shop, you let me know. Maybe in Seattle, maybe in Portland. Nowhere else. <laughs> okay. And I got to be honest. Um when I have to get my car fixed, regardless of how uh, conservative and insane the mechanic is, if you have my car for that stretch of time, I believe what you believe. If you're going to – this happened once. Somebody – I was in someone's office, and they had, like, uh, some poster of whatever. I – I honestly think it might have been like old, like it was Jimmy Carter with a bunch of like knives thrown into it. And I was, and if he had brought it up, I would have been like, what a poster, brother. Whoa. All right. Hey, about the car. <laughs> about the car. I'm also like that with Uber drivers because I don't want an uncomfortable Uber ride. And uh, that's happened. That, that happens on the road. There was one guy, I was in Springfield, Missouri, and I got picked up by an Uber driver who was in a truck, so I had to get in the front seat with him, and the whole time he was showing me, like, conservative TikToks, but he was also watching them, and we almost crashed. <laughs> Where it's like... He's, like, watching a video where just a woman on the phone being like, a young girl should not be idolizing Cardi B. And then we almost hit a car. <laughs> you know, but uh, when it comes to, like, journaling, which I think is a very personal thing, I don't want to see an Ayn Rand quote. That, that's one where I'm just like, yeah, I don't want that. I don't, I literally, like, I crossed it out, but it's still just like, I wish, I wish we could just make, like, a neutral can we is that too much to ask neutral self-help is that is that insane i mean 
Sure, conservatives can definitely have the, like, $10,000 three-day intense military boot camps. That's their thing. That's theirs. And if you've never seen those, they're really funny. Um, But journaling, I have to read, like, a George Bush quote when I'm writing down my goals for the day. I don't need that. Don't need it. No, thank you. Bums me out. Um... But, uh, yeah, that that's about all that's going on for me. I'm trying to dump more money into the podcast. That's, uh, that's tough. Spending money on stuff, man. Oh, it hurt. And it's easy when it's a small, stupid thing, too. If you're spending money on something small and dumb, oh, it's so easy. But if you're spending money on something big that will help you, so difficult. So many people will not get their their bicuspid fix. So many people have like a chipped tooth in the back where they just go, yeah, I just won't use that one. But they will buy a small hat for their dog. Don't know why. Can't tell you what that impulse in the human brain is and the human psyche is, but it's there. It's there. So, if the podcast starts looking a lot better, just know that I overcame something. And if it keeps looking, or the clips at least, if the clips keep looking exactly like they are, please yell at me in the comments. I would uh, I would really appreciate that. Let's get into some of the beautiful self-help questions I have found on Reddit. I scour Reddit, and I find self-help questions that people ask. Some of these are very reasonable. Some of these are completely insane. And they're both really fun to answer. So uh, let's get into this. I'm a little creeped out by a girl's behavior. Am I overreacting? So I met this woman like three times. She's 24. She texts and calls a lot. Like every time I check my phone, there's 50 messages and three missed calls. I'm honestly flattered to some extent. Okay, so you find this woman to be so hot. And that is clear by what you're saying. I have never been more sure <clears throat> that a woman is really hot. Th- this is more of a statement of how hot a woman is than if you showed me a picture of her and how hot she was. Because if you're receiving 50 text messages and three missed calls every time you check your phone from a person and you haven't called the police yet you you're stunned by that woman you're smitten by that woman I think that's very cute but I'm gonna go ahead and answer this very quickly for you and then we're gonna keep reading back away back away you will find a woman that you are equally attracted to that will not also set your car on fire when you tell her you're not interested and the deeper you get the more the the more smoldering your vehicle becomes in the future all right uh i'm honestly flattered to some extent i know i'm not super good looking or anything so this is the first time my life in my life that a woman is giving me so much attention been there usually girls uh talk to me like once a day or more times if they're more chatty during the initial courting phase but I've never met someone that texts and calls me that much. Brother, we got a beautiful expression for this. If it seems too good to be true, it's because it is. However, I'm creeped out on the last date where I said quite a few times that I wanted to go home and eat dinner with my mom, yet she just plain ignored me and kept staying in my car. Get out, dude. I was kind of creeped out by the amount of force she applied when she grabbed my hand and wouldn't let go. It's not like I couldn't break free, but felt rude doing so. It's like a you-cannot-leave kind of grab. You don't really have a father figure to ask for advice. Uh, I don't really have a father figure to ask for advice. I've never encountered this situation before. There's a lot of stuff playing right now. 
Um, I've definitely been in the position of not dating women for a very long time. And then you start dating. Maybe something happens for you. You get your braces off. Uh, you stop spitting when you speak. That was me. And you find this these moments of, oh, this is new. And when it's new, you got to be careful. You got to be very careful because you don't have a frame of reference for any of this stuff. Frames of reference go in two directions. One, they can really cut you off from experiences because maybe you have a frame of reference where you've been hurt in certain experiences and you are overly protective of yourself because of that, right? That's the negative side of frame of reference. Some people I'm speaking to right now might have that. But I think what is what outweighs that greatly is the beautiful benefit of having been through enough shit where when something like this happens, you immediately know what's going on and you can get out of it as soon as possible. And brother, let me tell you this. If you have someone who is calling you and texting you this much after three dates and staying in your car after you make it clear you would like to leave, you gotta get out. Get out of there. I know a lot of the time my dating advice is not this direct. I know a lot of the time my dating advice is not this uh, forward in its prescriptions. But this is a special circumstance. And to all the young people out there, when you start dating, you're going to get a lot of hits of endorphins, right? You're going to meet a lot of exciting people. And we have this tendency, especially if maybe we weren't successful in relationships early on, if maybe we weren't proud of relationships uh, early on, if maybe, like, uh, you know, we're late bloomers. When you finally do sink into that relationship or the dating pool or whatever you want to call it, we have this tendency to think, oh, well, I have to hang on to this because I don't know if another one is around the corner. I have to hang on to this, and I'll say it because you didn't, hot woman, I have to make sure I keep her around because I don't know if there's going to be another one coming around the corner. Brother, there is brother there trust me especially uh for you uh dating and you know i'm not saying this is good at all but uh the older you get as a guy the easier dating tends to become that's just how it is right that doesn't mean you can't find the love of your life early on and stick with that person that's definitely a possibility but hold out Hold out. Get away from this person. Get away from their... I mean, are they leaving messages where they're heavily breathing? This is only going to get worse. Do you understand me? If you're listening to me right now and you're in a similar situation, if it's like this three dates in, think about what it's going to be like three months in. How much of this are you going to put up with? Are you going to be posting in three months from now? Yeah, you know, there's this girl, and I think she's really into me, but she is writing notes on my front yard in pig's blood. And I just don't know if that's, like, a good or a bad sign. Like, sure, it's maybe a little bit over the top, but at least it's pig's blood. It's not something harder to get, like ostrich blood. Five months from then, it's like, yeah, you know, she is sacrificing members of my family, okay? (laughs) She is. We okay. So the girl I'm dating is sacrificing members of my family, but it's extended family. You know, it's extended family. So what? What should I do? Get get out. You get the hell out of there, young man. Good for you for dating. You're gonna find somebody who's interested in you. By the way, that's not what actual like interest looks like. 
I know that might be confusing to you. When someone's actually interested in you, it's usually much more couched in like an understandable amount of restraint. Um, it's not like that. It's not like that. Okay, this is a question. We have a question here. I'm only straight when I'm not high. I'm 15. Every time I get high, I feel really gay. Like really intensely gay to the point where I start crying, but I never feel that way when I'm not high. This wouldn't be such an issue if I didn't have a girlfriend. I do like her. I think. But I'm not sure if I even like women. I'm not sure what the best course of action is. I don't know if I should break up with her or if I should just ignore the possibility of homosexuality. Well, this is this is a tough question. I'll say this. You shouldn't be smoking weed that good when you're 15. You should not be consuming cannabis that good at the age of 15. Now, when I was 15, I went to my first party, and I smoked something that is way closer to an average shrub than it is cannabis, right? Went to my first party, I smoked something that was passed around that might have w as well have been moss that was found near a tree. If you're 15 and you're smoking that questioning my sexuality pack, you got to downgrade. Downgrade the weed. That's the first thing I'm going to say to you, buddy. You downgrade that weed. Right now, you should be smoking, oh, this movie's a little bit funnier type weed. You shouldn't be smoking that. What am I really? <laughs> no. I'm kidding. But I, I, I do think, truly, this is something that you should definitely investigate uh, in yourself. Be open with yourself. Don't judge yourself. If you are interested in men, that's not a bad thing, right? I mean, depending on where you are, it might be a, a tough thing to... Uh, it might be a tough thing to break to your parents. It might be a tough thing to break to your friends. That's all obviously a possibility. But I don't think you personally should judge yourself. I don't think you personally should uh, feel ashamed of this. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are. That This could just be something that's brought about by weed. It could just be something that uh, is dormant in you. Maybe you're just a little bit bi. That's a possibility. This is the great thing about living in the modern era is uh, when these feelings come up, you seem to have, and you're 15 so it makes sense, like kind of a unnuanced opinion when it comes to this, which is obviously fine, but it's like, if I, oh, if I like start questioning my sexuality, it means I'm gay, and it's like, that's not necessarily true, you know? Um, but it's also, it's hard, you know? When I was, uh, when I was younger, I was dating a woman. Well, not a woman. She was a I was 15, she was 15. Around that age. Maybe maybe younger. It might have been 14. And uh we broke up and she started telling people that I was gay. I know for sure she told one person because he asked me in the football locker room if I was gay. I am so lucky that my dad was a progressive guy because before that happened, I, you know, my dad had talked to me about this shit, which it's really good for a dad to do that because like that sort of your reflection of what all male life is and what all masculinity is. And my dad was very secure in his masculinity. He always was like, and he was just like, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're gay, I, I love you. It doesn't, like whatever when I was young like I I had asked him like what what gay was and he was like oh it's just you know men who are interested in men romantically and or physically like that's just what it is it's a very easy conversation to have for him um and when that happened 
I remember having a moment like as a young man where I was like, am I gay? Is this like a thing? Is she does she know something about me that I didn't know? And then later on it turned out she was gay. <laughs> Which is so funny. It's such a funny way of projecting because like and that also answered a lot of questions for me that were uh, very I was very happy that uh, those questions were answered. Um, But my frame of reference was just really limited. Right. And uh, luckily it wasn't insanely limited just because my dad talked about it. So like that that kid coming up to me and being like, yo, so and so said you're gay. Is that true? I, I wasn't like, oh, my God, this is the worst. Thing. I was like, oh, no, I'm not. It was like it was pretty easy. And then I was like, hmm, am I? Uh, I don't think so. And it turned out like, no. But I it, that's what's so funny to me is like. I think if you have uh, parents who don't villainize being gay, it's the only real way to be 100 percent sure your whole life that you're straight. Because if you have parents that, like, villainize being gay, like, there always has to be at least a little thing in your head where it's like, well, am I just doing what I was brought up to do? (laughs) You're making out with a woman, you're like, is that just what my dad wanted? (laughs) That's what's so funny, is, like, you know, I grew up on the coast, and, like... You know, rightfully so, the coast is seen as this place that's, like, you know, more progressive. I mean, not all of the coast. Not all of Massachusetts, especially. <laughs> you can find some places in Massachusetts where they were like, we are voting Democrat, but you better not put that in that hole. That that's that sh- sums up Massachusetts. We are voting Democrat, but I better not see you fellas doing that over there. <laughs> but, um... But the I, I like I don't know if you grow up in Missouri and you're like oh, I'm straight it's like you sure <laughs> how much opportunity do you have to investigate that like I grew up on the coast and I'm 100 percent straight I've never been attracted to men I've never been interested in men and I know that's true because I have had opportunities to explore and I've had no interest in it. But if you're in Missouri, how are, how do you know? How do you know? That's my question. But, uh, yeah, man, I mean, you know, uh, can you ignore the possibility that this is... I mean, you know, if, if every time you smoke weed, you think you're gay. I mean, I think it's one of two things. Either, like, you're just kind of getting paranoid from the weed, and uh, that's definitely a possibility. And th- th- it might just be, like paranoia brought on by the weed and the your sight your thoughts are cycling in this direction it's definitely a possibility that you shouldn't take off the table but also it's like you know maybe but uh just know that's fine it's fine if it is fine it's a you know i think thinking about it as a spectrum is kind of like good because you don't have to get locked into this identity uh just because like some something comes up in your thoughts you can kind of like investigate it and be like yeah, like you maybe are a little attracted to men that's fine uh even if you have a girlfriend that's you know i think there's a lot of it, it, you would be shocked i think and i know this just from being close friends with a lot of people you would be shocked by the amount of straight couples that have had conversations like this You'd be shocked by the amount of straight guys who have talked to their girlfriends been like, yeah, you know, I'm a little bi-curious. And I think women, for the most part, and not all of them, not all of them, let me say this, not all of them, but for the most part, are pretty open to the, like, uh, idea of, like, talking about that. Um, More than your buddies that you play football with, I'll say. But uh, it's tough at 15, man. I mean, it's tough. You have a lot of identity challenging moments at 15. Uh, I definitely don't think this is any any by any stretch of the imagination outside the norm. Um, but definitely at any rate, downgrade the weed that you are smoking. OK. Downgrade that Chiba. OK, we got this. How can I survive a sexless marriage? 
I am a 30-year-old woman, and my husband is a 35-year-old man. That's not good. That's if you're if it's 30 and 35 and sexless, he should have something left in the tank. He should have a little something left in the tank. I do think like I mean porn has really run rampant through male biology at this point. And I listen, no judgment. I I talked about this uh, on an earlier episode. It's like no judgment if you consume porn, and I think there's a very healthy way to consume porn. I think even people who make porn understand that there is an unhealthy way to consume it. And, uh, yeah, I think it is kind of insane. Uh, when you, when you, I hear like my friends' libidos are like low, I'm like, dude. I mean, no judgment. Some people naturally have that, but listen, personally, can't get enough of this stuff. <laughs> um, my husband and I don't have sex on a regular basis. It's a few times in a week. Then we'll go three months, three months of nothing. It feels like I'm the only one initiating sex. He constantly makes excuse, excuses, which is always, I'm tired. A few months ago, I put on some lingerie, and he was completely unmoved. I can't remember the excuse he made, but it broke me. Yeah, it should. Oh, man, that idea hurts my soul. Putting on lingerie. And getting turned down. That's a level of vulnerability I will never have. Is putting on lingerie. And the person you put it on for goes, no thank you. How do you not, how do you not, like, drive away still wearing the lingerie? That's nuts. I would just... I if I mean, and I know that you know my psyche is probably different than the average woman, but I would just walk outside. <laughs> like, is anyone interested in this? Oh, you are. All right. Well, you're scary, so I'm gonna go back inside. <laughs> um, I recently discovered how much porn he watched. Ding, 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 ding. I knew it. I knew it. And when I told him it feels like he replaced me with porn, he got really defensive. The argument was pretty ugly, to be honest. Although it happened five months ago, nothing has changed. I voiced my opinion so many times, and I'm frustrated. I think about cheating, but is it worth breaking up my family? Would he ever understand? Uh, don't cheat. Uh, but, I mean, I could see I could see why you're thinking about it. This is one of those cases where it's like, I mean, I, I have a very strict anti-cheating stance uh not a fan of the stuff folks but um there's a difference between uh like something being an excuse and something being understandable and i'm saying in this situation at least to me personally i don't know about you listening but at least to me personally i go that makes sense <laughs> i under i understand why you would be thinking about cheating in this situation um we have one child together who is now a toddler. He told me once during a heart-to-heart -heart that my body has changed since the birth of our baby, and he's still adjusting. Him saying that hurt a lot, but is that really it? Is he no longer sexually attracted to me because I'm carrying around a baby weight? Well, I, I mean, even if that is the case, um, it's like... you There's... There's maybe like a degree of communication that should be had if that's the way that he's feeling. I definitely don't think that was brought up in a good way. I don't think that was like, I don't think that was broached by him in a positive way. And also it's like you got to meet in the middle. I mean, there's a difference between not being as attracted to somebody for whatever reason and going three months and never initiating sex. Like, like, uh... You know, I mean, I'm sure that I've made changes to uh, my physical appearance where people I've dated have become 
less attracted to me because of it. Like I've I've done every style change that you can do, good or bad. I have a mullet and a mustache. Okay. My girlfriend does like it, but it would be understandable if she didn't. I would get it. I'd probably change it for her, to be honest with you. That's just the kind of feller I am. And uh, this this is this is like a tough thing to really talk about because there's so much baggage to be brought into it. But uh, let's start at the top. Um, this is definitely something that, just from what you're describing, he has to fucking do something or you guys need to have some serious conversations. But uh, y- I don't think you're in the wrong at all, especially because it's like you had a kid. You, he didn't have to be pregnant. What like you had to carry a baby? He just watches Pornhub and waits. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, so I'll say that right off, right off the bat, it's like, and you're putting an effort. You're wearing lingerie and trying to entice him, and he's still saying no. Listen, I mean, if he it, let's just say, and I'm not saying this is the case, but let's just say he's just no longer attracted to you. Like, then you guys gotta call it quits like you don't deserve that you deserve better i know with the kid that becomes uh tough but you at least need to talk about this more right when i say call it quits i don't mean like uh you have to get a divorce or anything but like you do definitely need to have a very strong conversation about this sort of thing because the resentment is only gonna build from here um But when it comes to uh, when it comes to what you're saying, where it's like he told you that your baby weight makes him unattracted to you. I mean, that's rough to hear uh, a but um, I think like in a relationship uh, where there's not a kid involved, uh, I think it's probably a good rule of thumb to it it's like twofold i think tell tell me what you think about this in the comments but like i think a relationship kind of should be twofold in this way you personally should be doing things uh to keep yourself up to uh be sexy for your partner and that that can look a bunch of different ways because people have a bunch of different preferences right for me personally i like to try to keep my apartment clean and I fail at that a lot. Like, I, luckily, I have uh, my girlfriend is very good with like understanding that it's something that I struggle with. And I, but she has to understand that I'm doing my best to clean the apartment, right? Like, I don't think it has to be one or the other. I think it should be both. I think you as a partner should love the person you're with unconditionally or at least like unconditionally isn't isn't really the right word right because there's conditions like if they're not hitting me right that's a condition that I think is pretty understandable but um I love this person regardless of the ebbs and flows of life right if they put on a few putting on a few pounds happens that just happens if your relationship can't survive that I mean, you got to figure that out, right? You you need your partner. I mean, I, I that that's one thing, but it's like, uh, and then you personally, like, I think your responsibility is to keep things sexy for your partner. That that can take a lot of different uh, like manifestations, right? But it seems like you're doing that. It seems like you're already doing that. I don't know what the fuck he's doing. To be honest with you, and I know we're just getting your side of the story here, but it doesn't seem like he's really putting in any effort. He's just flipping on porn, which is not helping this situation, by the way. If he's like, oh, your body isn't what I want. It's like, is that is that true? Maybe it is, but is it, could it be the porn talking? Could it be the fact that he's watching 90-pound women get thrown around a room for two hours, and he looks at you, and he goes, that's not what I'm used to. <laughs> um... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, 
the kid thing is is the sticking point here because if there wasn't a kid, I would immediately be like, "Listen, you got to like sit down and have this talk." And if it doesn't go, if this doesn't change, you got to get out of there. But with a kid, I don't really have input with that, to be honest with you, because uh, I know I said I said something along the lines of like, "You got to get out of there," but it's like you can't say that really with a kid involved, can you? Like there there has to be a little bit of understanding there that like. And that's not – listen, my parents got out of there, and I was the kid in that situation, so it's still possible. And I, I turned out – um, you know what? We won't go there. <laughs> but uh, you shouldn't cheat, and th- this is this is where I do actually go like you should maybe start thinking about getting out of there. If you cheat, this gets a whole lot uglier. If you cheat, this gets a whole lot worse for you and your family. So if the if the the question is between cheating and breaking up, I, I kind of say you, you break off the marriage. But before then, try to have the conversation. That's what I'll go ahead and say. This has been a good episode so far. I've really liked I've liked these questions and I've liked uh, answering them. This is the last one we have here. I, 27, female, and trying to turn my life around completely and have a mental and physical glow up. I quit drinking three weeks ago, quit vaping 11 days ago, and I'm very proud, but I have found myself replacing the missing serotonin with other unhealthy habits. First of all, before I say anything, let me say congratulations. Um, if you feel like drinking and vaping is getting in the way of you living a happy, healthy life, it is great that you are getting rid of those things. Cold turkey is a tough road. And it's a road that is laced with nicotine and uh, gambling and pornography because we will find ways to replace that if it's taken away too quickly. I think like... Uh, things like drinking and vaping give people so much serotonin. Like, I think kind of an unhealthy amount of serotonin, if we're being honest, if you're doing both of them at the same time. And I say that because I have been out with my friends. And they have been drinking. And then they'll pull out a vape. And I go, no human being should be this happy and content. I go, this is an experience that should be reserved for people in heaven what you're feeling right now luckily none of that stuff really does it for me personally but when i see it i go this is this is uh this is a little overkill on the serotonin machine gun um i have put on so much weight because i've been eating so much and i have downloaded dating apps just for some interaction that i know i don't want If not alcohol, it's nicotine. If it's not nicotine, it's caffeine. If it's not caffeine, it's sex. If it's not sex, it's food. If it's not food, it's buying things. The list is never ending, and I wish I knew ways to replace these bad habits with positive, healthy ones. Does anyone know how to do this? First of all, I don't think having some vice is that bad, especially for certain people. Um, I think that it can really help you let off steam in a way where things don't have to be like so one way or the other. You don't have to be so I'm completely celibate and abstinent from everything that gives me joy or, uh, you know, I'm uh, watching pornography on the back of a motorcycle butt naked while a guy is... uh, handing me a vape from uh, from the driver's seat of that motorcycle and doing a wheelie. We can find the middle ground between those two things, right? Like, sobriety is great, and uh, I ha- I've had a lot of friends, especially in comedy, that have done 12-step. Uh, uh, and I think it's great. I think it's great. I think it works for them. I think it's a, a great way of getting over addiction. And uh, I think quitting substance, substances and like admitting that you're an addict and stuff is uh, really important and a huge part of people's lives. 
But uh, when I see people who have gone through that, a lot of the times they do replace. And a lot of the times that replacement just takes a while to even out. But I think one of the things that's really tough for people to get over is to just like understand that what their baseline is now for serotonin. And let's just let's get out of the because I'm not a, a psychiatrist or whatever. I should have a psychiatrist on or a psychologist on. Um, so let's just say your level of comfort. And I'll go a step further. And I'm sorry to use uh, use this kind of language, but your level of hedonic co- comfort, let's just say. And I'm not a person that's against hedonic co- uh, comfort in any way. Uh, like there's absolutely, I love, I love eating a huge ass meal. I love it. I, I'm a, I'm big. I hate saying this huge fan of sex, right? It's great. Big fan of it. Um, and I don't think that's but honestly on, on your list of things. It's like, if it's unhealthy sex, absolutely very bad. But if it's, you know. You and a consenting partner, you both trust each other. That's not a bad coping mechanism, to be honest with you. It's like uh, I've just luckily fallen into healthy coping mechanisms, and I'll share some of them uh, when it comes to this. It's like uh, exercise, healthy sex, um, like I, I, I use caffeine. I, I know that you you probably have problems with that, problems with uh, overusing it, but it's like, I think that uh, sort of developing healthier coping mechanisms is great, but then on top of that, it's just going to be lowering your baseline of comfort, understanding that, like, the discomfort that you're feeling and that, like, need to reach out for something and grab something should be slowly brought down. You don't want to drop that off a cliff. Like, I honestly don't know if uh, cold turkeying alcohol and vaping at the same time is the best idea. I think a lot of people would probably agree with me. Like, I really do think that there's probably uh, a better way of weaning yourself off of those two things. Because it's not just it's not just alcohol, it's not just uh, nicotine. It's just your overall comfort levels. Because we all have a comfort threshold. Everybody does. And the crazy thing about it is we can adjust our comfort thresholds. It takes a long time and you want to ease into it. But over time, you can get used to a level of discomfort. But then the question is, how much discomfort is healthy? And what are you sacrificing by not feeling that level of comfort? I've I've gone too far in the discomfort direction. And now that I've come back, I've realized so many positives from finding balance with that stuff. Um, I mean, one of which, and this is like a huge one, being able to relate to people more, right? Like... And that's what I'll say. I know I bring this up a lot when it comes to addiction, but it's like I think you have a great view into the human psyche due to the fact that you are reaching out for these comforts and and uh, in this uh, situation, addictions so hard. And it's because like um, a lot of people struggle with those issues. And I, I don't relate to people very well when it comes to addiction, to be honest with you. I, it's, it's something that I've come to through a very interesting means, actually, because uh, I don't have a lot of addictive tendencies. And so my friend and f- my friends and family is going through addictions has just taught me to go, well, there's some things I just don't understand. And you have to be okay with that. Like, I personally, when I'm reading this sort of stuff, uh, it's hard for me to personally relate to it, to be honest with you, because I've been lucky enough, and I do think it's luck, I've been lucky enough to develop very healthy coping mechanisms when it comes to increasing, let's just say, my regular comfort level in the world. But a lot of people develop that. Oh, and when you see those patterns out there, folks, I'm a man who loves poker. I'm a man who loves gambling. 
and that means I go to casinos. A casino is such a lovely place to look around and go, this is unhealthy coping. What I'm seeing right here. And by the way, if you think people who gamble are like happy at the tables, you haven't been in a casino. They're angry. They're not even like com- comfortable. They've just fallen into the patterns of gambling and stuff so heavily that it's just kind of what they do now. But uh, yeah, I, as far as healthy ways to get serotonin, because that was your initial question. I mean, exercise is so huge. And not just exercise, like a lot of addicts, uh, I think, find like communal exercise to be so good. Because when you're alone exercising, like you are still kind of stuck with your thoughts. And some people like that, some people don't. But it's like um, rock climbing for me seems like, and by the way, a rock climbing gym, it might as well just be an AA meeting. The amount of people that are certainly former addicts in a rock climbing gym would blow your goddamn mind. It's crazy. It's crazy. They're not running away from their problems. They're climbing away from their problems, those folks. That is a used to do heroin factory. The climbing gym. And they're good people. They're great people. Love those folks. Um... So, yeah, exercise is great, Uh, like, hobbies also. Um, I think, like, sleep, the more sleep you get, the more willpower you'll have. That That's kind of my way of looking at it. I'm sure people look at sleep very differently than that, but, like, I really do think that the more sleep you get, the more, uh, the more willpower I will have in a given day. And uh, I think that it's pretty challenging uh to fight those urges when you um when you don't have enough sleep. We got time for one more. Let's do one more. Why not? Would you rather look good or feel good? Real question. I think looking good, having the perfect figure, perfect hair, skin, etc. is overlaid rated and will cause anxiety. If happiness is determined by how you look, for sure you'll have huge mood swings, but look seems to be what people care about, men and women. If people focus on their happiness, they will also look good no matter their physical appearance. A smiling face is always a beautiful face. Um, That's a funny question. I mean, I think this sort of gets into uh, the subjective qualities of looks, which are very important to uh, understand. It's like, are there people who are societally objectively good looking for the most part? Sure. I mean, different societies, different cultures have different standards of beauty, but uh, I think it's, it's fair to say that at least when it comes to the American uh, standard of beauty, there are people who fall into it more than others. But I think obviously feeling good. And the reason why feeling good is like, if you feel good, you will feel like you look good, or at least you won't be so judgmental of your own looks and stuff. And also, let me just tell you, the best way to exemplify this is the opposite is very, very common. There are so many people who objectively look good, and when you delve into their psyches, you realize it ain't doing it for them, folks. It ain't doing it for them. That's a great way also to combat jealousy because I know, like, hey, me me especially, I mean, I've felt this very deeply. Um, When I see a guy and he's, like, six foot five, it's not bad when they're far away from you. Here's the thing about being insecure about your height. It's not bad when they're far away from you. And I'm five foot ten. Right, I know that there's guys who are way more insecure about their height than me. There's guys shorter than me who are way more secure about their height than me too. So it's it's funny how that works. But like, the funny thing about height is, I'm not jealous of it when I am uh, far away from a person. It's when they're next to you. Fuck that! I have to look up at you to talk to you. <laughs> I hate that. I hate that. 
Get down on my level, tall people. How dare you? How dare... Or you see the tall guy standing next to your girlfriend. Ooh. Oh, you ever see a tall guy standing next to your girlfriend? You... Man, I... I'll pull a fire alarm. All right? I'll yank a fire alarm. I see that shit. You get the hell away. (laughs) My girlfriend has to look up at you to talk to you? I don't think so. You know what? I don't care where his eyes are. You stare straight ahead at that man. I don't care if you're looking at his chest. I'd prefer that. How dare you? How dare you, sir? With your height. But, uh, I mean, it, it's funny because, like, the core of those insecurities are almost always rooted in unhappiness. So if you're happy, you go, like, who cares? As a thought experiment, I think it is really fun and really interesting to imagine yourself as a person who is unbothered by your own physical features and shortcomings. I really do. Because I think part of that will seep into your brain, and I think part of you will go, oh, yeah, I could just feel that way. I mean, doing stand-up, it's so funny because are stand-up comics, uh, for the most part, incredibly mentally ill? Yes. Uh, Are they often incredibly unhappy? Yes. But it does show one very interesting thing, which is, like, people can overcome the social anxiety of shortcomings by feeling funny and and like funny can like you you don't have to try to be funny if you feel insecure about your uh physical appearance but like i think it what what it it's really based in is just like the confidence of being able to do something and just being happy like when you feel accomplished when you feel happy i think you're so much less likely to even give a shit about those sorts of things and i think that Focusing on the happiness rather than focusing on the physical shortcoming is probably the best way to go. Um, And I know that I'm talking from an ivory tower right now. um, And I'm very, very lucky in that there's, like, not a ton of uh, physical things that I'm super insecure of. But I still have them. You know what I mean? I'll look at the mirror and go, are my nipples weird? I don't know. Uh, all right. Well, that that's the podcast, folks. But I do have some very important announcements here. Uh, number one, please check out the Patreon. I'm really trying to build that out. Um, please subscribe. Please comment. Please like. Oh, and the comment emoji of the week. Uh, if if you've stayed for the plugs, you know what's coming. I'm gonna tell you if you on YouTube. Uh, if you've made it this far, I'm gonna tell you an emoji to post, and that emoji means you are a core powerful executive branch member of the dancers podcast and i'm i'm trying to look up i don't really know exactly i mean i use emojis but i use three of them that that's about that that shows my age i'm 29 so i i use emojis but i use like a total of five when i see somebody going crazy with emojis i go man you got you really got something going you're using the flamingo um let's go egg post an egg if you've made it this far in the video on youtube please post an egg um if not just thank you so much for listening i really appreciate it uh and we'll be back next week and i'm going to do another patreon episode if you join the patreon five dollars a month and we have different tiers there it's just pretty much there to help support me and you get an extra episode if you're really into the pod so thank you so much really appreciate you as always have a good one